Welcome to the LSU Sports Insider, brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate, NOLA.com, and the Times-Picayune. Perrin Keyes here hanging out with Edward Scott Rabelais, who had a busy weekend, and Reed Darcy, who also had a busy weekend. We've got a busy, uh, a busy weekend's worth of stuff to, uh, to go through uh, here on the LSU Sports Insider. Uh, of course, uh, LSU baseball drops two out of three. Spring practice continues. Uh, gymnastics is going on. Softball is going on. But, of course, the, uh, the number one story uh, here in this town at the moment, of, co of course, is the LSU women in the NCAA tournament. They are through now to the Sweet 16, and we will discuss that at length in addition to the SEC champion LSU gymnastics team. Uh, if you haven't seen, uh, if you're looking for a place to catch up on spring football, uh, check out our previous podcast. You can check that out on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com, and all our social channels, as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever other finer podcasts are found. Rab, when is something interesting going to happen here uh, on the LSU beat? It would be nice if there was something that we're just going to, you know, it's, it's been, it's always boring. There's never anything going on. Nobody says anything interesting. Nobody does anything interesting. What, what are we going to do about all this? I, I know. We're going to have to go and um, light some fires at LSU or something. something. I, I don't know. It, it's, 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 I don't know what other people do covering other schools. Like I was watching Stanford. <laughs> the Stanford women play basketball last time. Their football team is meh, and their men's basketball team is meh, and their baseball team is usually pretty good, and they have a lot of good Olympic athletes, but uh, you never hear a whole lot of... You know, Tiger Woods went there. Okay, yeah, that's exciting, but uh, unless Tiger drops in, there's not a whole lot of drama going maybe on there. Maybe they're too smart for their own good. I don't know. Uh, it could be. Uh, maybe they signed something, you know, to private school. Maybe they signed <laughs> something before they all enroll. Uh, Reed Darcy's first year on the LSU women's beat, and he's getting his money's worth. It's been it's been eventful, uh, <laughs> to say the least. Um, a not, season on the brink. <laughs> <laughs> this, a lot, a lot has happened. This is something happened. else, and uh, we've got at least uh, yeah. at least one more week to go, if not possibly two. So we will see about the LSU women in the Sweet 16, and of course we will discuss Kim Mulkey's. Um, uh, surprising a Saturday press conference, I suppose you would say. But uh, first, let's get into a bit of business, as we always do. Uh, this is the LSU Sports Insider. Uh, we are coming to you every Monday and Thursday, as I said, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever other finer podcasts are found. Also on our social channels, uh, specifically our YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. You can catch us there live every Monday and Thursday. If you don't catch us there, uh, live on Monday and Thursday. You can always catch us there after the fact. Please subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to The Advocate, of course. Don't miss a moment of all the fun and games that are going on on the LSU campus right now, uh, not even including inside the PMAC. So uh, uh, The Advocate's always been the number one destination for LSU sports coverage. You guys know that if you're tuning in. So please subscribe if you haven't already, whether that's print or digital. Go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe. Stay up to date with all the headlines. You certainly don't want to miss a moment, not right now. Uh, you can get all the headlines delivered straight to your inbox, to your phone, to your desktop. Uh, to do that, you go to theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. And of course, we are brought to you by Champion Wealth Strategies. Champion Wealth Strategies is a national financial services firm specializing in the capital markets, securities, insurance, 401ks, and college and retirement planning. Our broker dealer is LPL, financial member FINRA, SIPC. As you know, investments are not FDIC insured, may lose value, and have no bank guarantee. To learn more, go to championwealthstrategies.com and plan like a champion today. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, let's talk a little LSU women's basketball uh, for uh, the majority of this podcast, this fine podcast, because there's always something fun going on, seems like. Uh, and uh, in all seriousness, uh, LSU, of course, uh, enters the tournament as a number three seed, number three in the uh, very rough and tough Albany two region, probably the toughest region. I think that's sort of uh, agreed upon, uh, generally speaking, across the nation. They start off against Rice. They do not look like a well-oiled machine, frankly, against Rice. They sort of muddle through. They beat them 70 to 60. Uh, and then they uh, start off slowly against Middle Tennessee and find themselves in a fight before they really, really, really turn it on. Uh, first things first, Rab, I'll just sort of get your take on uh, on these two games this, this weekend and uh, what it tells you about LSU, if anything. Yeah, you know, it, it's not entirely different from the way they played 
in the NCAA tournament leading up to the Final Four last year. Mm-hmm. You know, they they kind of they certainly ground their way through that regional final against Miami and the, and the the Hawaii game uh, to start the the uh, tournament last year wasn't uh, always a thing of beauty. Twenty four turnovers is a lot. The LSU, I think Reed would agree. The LSU plays kind of a high risk style. You know, they're always looking to push the ball up. You know, length of the court passes and, <laughs> and, and you know go fast and try to beat the other team down the court. And you're going to have some turnovers, but uh, but twenty four a season high that was that was really over the top and a lot of unforced errors by right. LSU. Uh, you know, Rice was a, a scrappy uh, team, but you're like. They they had like fourteen losses coming in. I mean, they were like someone who should push you, but they got through it. Uh, that's that's not totally uncommon. And then and then they kind of seemed like the same thing. They were down nine points early in the second half to Middle Tennessee, and then they just you, you say, it was hard to flip the switch in the postseason. But they did. I think it was thirty nine to eight the rest of the game after they uh, they got that far behind. And uh, after they went down uh, nine, yeah, it was fifty-one it, it, to fifteen. Fifty-one to fifteen. Okay. They scored fifty-one points okay. in the second half. Yeah, and uh, it was a there was thirty-nine to eight run at some some yes. point in there, but fifty-one to fifteen in the second yes. half, and. Uh, it was a. It, I was told to be no math. You know, I'm a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> Pack off, man. I'm a journalist. Don't ask me to do numbers. And uh, uh, so that's the team that looks like they can play with anyone in the in the NCAA tournament, including vaunted South Carolina. Right. So um, that's the team they've got to be in the Sweet 16 and uh, the Elite Eight if they get there. And uh, obviously they can. Uh, the the you know the uh, LSU has some obvious shortcomings. You know, the, uh, not not a deep bench. Uh, you know they're they're shooting. You know, do, you know doesn't the shots don't fall sometimes, but they can get two double doubles from Reese and Morrow, and if they get one of the players outside to play outstanding. And, and Flaugier Johnson, I think, played outstanding uh, in in both games, especially yesterday. Uh, they can get at least her or Williams or Van Lith to 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 score like they did. They're a tough out, right. and uh, that but that's the team they got to be when they go to Albany. Read uh, the opening game, LSU 70, Rice 60. Uh, Anissa Moore winds up leading the team with 15 points, and I'm going to refer to my notes here. If I'm not mistaken, she was one of four players in double figures. Uh, but this was not, this was, again, as we say, this was not what you would call a vintage performance. Four of 15 from the floor in the first quarter just looked very sloppy. And frankly, this was, it, it was... Uh, the atmosphere seemed like it was getting a little tight there in the PMAC uh, for much of the game. Uh, yeah, definitely. It, it was very tight um, throughout that game. It was just really a sloppy game, you know, and, and Kim Mulkey said after the game, she sort of, it reminded her of, you know, that, like what Rab mentioned, that game against Miami in the Elite Eight last year when she told everybody to turn off the TV, yeah. you, know, you know, if they were watching. And um, even in the, in the Middle Tennessee um, Middle Tennessee game, like, you know, at the start of that second half, I was getting ready to write the obituary on the season. Yep. You know, they were down nine, right? Yep. And then, and then they they flip the switch. And I think the story, if you yeah, yeah, asked me the, across those first two games, um, story was the free throws. Um, if you look at the discrepancy in free throws that they they uh, got over those two games, it was really huge. Uh, Middle Tennessee, they, they outshot them. Um, LSU had 37 free throw attempts. Middle Tennessee had nine. Um, and it was about it was pretty similar in, in the game against Rice. I don't right. know the Rice was of six of eight. LSU was twenty two of thirty one. Yeah, so that that's how they got through those two games. Right. You know, it's the free throws. And, right. and there's already a little bit of discourse online about you know LSU's home. They got a good good whistle. You know, against Middle Tennessee. You know, there's, the discrepancy shouldn't have been that large. But if you look at the numbers, Middle Tennessee, half of their shots were three pointers. Mm-hmm. You know, they took thirty one threes. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you take thirty one three pointers. You're not going to get to the foul line as often. Probably because, and, and I, I still wouldn't necessarily unsubscribe to the theory that maybe LSU got a got a friendly whistle uh, more, you know, more more occasions than Middle Tennessee did. But by the same token, it's probably smart thinking on the part of Middle Tennessee, and it worked for a good long while because probably against Anissa Morrow and Angel Reese, you're not gonna you're not gonna do a whole lot of damage inside. You had to be able to shoot from outside and score and. And, and listen, score they did for, for quite a while. As you, you mentioned, they were up at halftime and they went up nine in the third quarter before, before and we're going to get to Flaw J too because, boy, did she turn it on. But uh, they, LSU was on the ropes. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, Angel and Kim Mulkey both said after the Rice game that, like, when we play like this against anybody else, it's, we're, yes. we're pretty much done. 
Yes. And they played very similarly in the first, you know, two and a half quarters uh, against Middle Tennessee. So it was certainly good to see them turn it on. Let's talk about Flaw J. Johnson because uh, she obviously, Reed, as you made mention many times now, she, boy, did she have a, a hell of a performance in the SEC tournament to start off, uh, having turned it on, and then certainly led the way. Uh, to one degree against Rice, but most most certainly led the way against Middle Tennessee. 21 points, team high. Uh, Morrow and Reese both had double doubles, as you made reference to. But it was it was not only 21 points; it was her uh, it was her fire, and it was her certainly her spirit of play on on defense as well. I yep. thought third quarter, I believe she had two steals on a block or two mm -hmm. blocks and a steal or something like that. She made, you know, one of the best plays uh, I've seen in a while where she sort of blocked um, Middle Tennessee, like a floater attempt, I guess, and it was right. a jump ball and then possession the other way, and she sort of stared her down and, and just grabbed the ball and took it the other way. That, that was really cool. So the, all, the, all the talk after the game was about how their defense leads to their transition offense and what they really need to do to really get their offense going they need to run. They need to get out in transition. That's when they play their best offensive basketball. And to do that, they got to get that, stops. Got to get stops. They weren't getting stops throughout the first half and at the start of the third quarter. Once they start getting <laughs> stops, then you could see the transition offense come alive, and then it snowballs from there. And 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 you see exactly what this team is capable of. Like, <coughs> like it's it's been like this throughout the season. There there are peaks and valleys, you know. And, and the peaks are really really good. The valleys are you know sloppy they're they're right. they're they aren't great so it's sort of like you know it, it's always been a challenge to sort of figure out exactly what this team is and it's always been a challenge for them to find that consistency um, but if they are playing as well as they can be if they're hitting their ceiling um they they're one of a few teams that can win the national title this and, year and you say well hey maybe that's a, and i know we've discussed this on, on uh the last couple of podcasts but you know hey maybe it's this championship hangover like they have, aren't, aren't necessarily as focused as they were before i don't buy that for a minute because going back to what you just mentioned rab the miami game last year in the ncaa tournament to get to the final four that was a rock fight Again, and I, I keep on meaning to look up her name, but uh, the the young freshman from Utah who they played in the Sweets, it was a Sweet 16, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. They, she was something like an 84 percent free throw shooter. She makes she makes her free throws, and LSU's done. Their their march is over. So, uh, and then of course they get to the championship game, and and as Kim Mulkey herself said, that was she's never had that happen where her team plays its best game, its absolute best, at in the championship when you absolutely needed your best game from Jasmine Carson and Alexis and whoever else. So uh, it, it's it's going to be an interesting sight, uh, of course, as we go down the road. I was going to ask you, uh, I'll start with you, Reb, just uh, before, and yes, believe me, we're going to get to the Kim Mulkey <sighs> address. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah. But uh, I, I just was curious to ask you about the atmosphere in the game, on both on both. For both games, I, you know, I know the app, they were, it was certainly jumping in both games in the PMAC, but in particular, the second game, and, and I mentioned this to you before, before the mics got hot, as they say, uh, I'm curious to know if you feel like this is an apt comparison. I'm, I'm reminded of the 2019 men's game between LSU and Vanderbilt to close, to close out the regular season. Will Wade gets suspended and all of a sudden, Auburn, it was Auburn, right, who lost early in the, earlier in the, it was it Tennessee? I can't remember now. I don't remember. Who, whoever it was, they had a chance to win the championship, uh, win a share of the championship going in, and uh, somebody lost earlier in the LSU day. LSU had to beat Vandy to win it outright. Right, to, to, yeah. to, which then gave LSU the opportunity to beat Vandy that night to win the championship outright. And, of course, Joe Oliva at that time was public enemy number one because this uh, suspension had just come down. I mean, it was this weird combination of this is a celebration, it's a party, it's, a, it, you know, the crowd's having a blast, but there's also sort of this undercurrent of everybody in the world is, like, out for blood and wants a little venom and is, you know, hostile, hostile at their own AD and hostile at the... You know, at the situation that just unfolded with Will Wade getting suspended. I'm curious to know, it's, it's, it's not a perfect analogy, but I'm curious to know just sort of what the atmosphere was like. Was there any of that in the in the atmosphere in the PMAC on Sunday afternoon? Uh, I hate to put a pin in your long preamble <laughs> about your question, <laughs> but 
I, I didn't feel there was the same atmosphere. I'd never okay. seen anything like that before or since in the in, in any sports venue. <laughs> was like one for the LSU for the game ages, man. in 2019. Because, but you had someone in the arena to foc- for people right. to focus. I mean, Joe Oliva should have gone home and not <laughs> come to the game. And he goes and sits in his regular seat right by the court and behind the bench. And everybody knows he's right there. And they're just blasting him. They're cheering and they're booing and they're ch- chanting. And I've never seen anything quite like that, a combination of celebration and anger. Anger. Is, is there a little bit of anger? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look. Defiance? De, I mean, defiance, isn't there some, some defiance in the crowd? Look, Kim Mulkey taps into something that uh, with, with the LSU fan base is like defiant. You know, you know. Like I'm, I'm from Louisiana. Right. I, I was born. I was born here. I was born in Baton Rouge. I was raised here. I went to LSU. There is a feeling of that everyone else looks down on Louisiana. Well, 49th that, and 50th. And yeah, everything. And, yeah. But when you get some, some, but once in a while, you have somebody who's really excellent or some, something that's really excellent. And she is. She's from Louisiana. Right. She, she's not only winning. It's not like even different from like when Nick Saban came here and won and everything or you know, at Alabama. She's from here. And people can say she's ours. I'm not. I'm not talking in the we sense because I'm being a reporter. Reporter here, and I have to have that that distance. But um, there's that, and so there's that love for her. And then you know, she lifts everybody up and makes them so makes them feel good about uh, uh, forgetting that the 49th and the 50th rankings and all that stuff. They were number one last year. Right. Number one. Right. And uh, that's something. And Jay John and the people love the baseball team for winning the national championship. But that's something that Jay Johnson quite. It's not quite the same for him because he's from California. Mm-hmm. No offense to him, but it's just it's just different. And so um, there's a little bit of that. I would say with, with all this talk about the Washington Post story and everything, and, and of course you're referring to the press conference she had on Saturday, the the, the between day press conference. I, I, obviously, people were aware of that, and there was some support of her. But um, it, um, <laughs> You know, compare if you, if it was if the LSU Vandy game in 2019 was a 10 on that meter, I think this was a three. You know, in terms of that anger being part of the uh, or wanting to defend her being part of their reaction to the game, it was a tr- just tremendous. Both games were a tremendous atmosphere. Yes, and I will say this too: going there's never been anything like this in the P. She has galvanized the fan base to such a point where. And of course, all women's basketball has enjoyed a renaissance of, of, of popularity with these these uh, these great personalities in terms of players and coaches and whatever, but um, and great crowds everywhere and TV ratings and all that. But in the Simone Augusta, Sylvia Fowles days, the, the, when they'd host NCAA tournament games, uh, and they didn't every year because it was a slightly different format, the PMAC would be half full. It would be loud. Is that right, really? So yeah, they'd get six or seven thousand, you know, wow. for for a game. And in the Nikki Fargus days, it'd be three oh, or four thousand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a couple hundred. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I mean, for the for the NCAA tournament oh, games, okay. there weren't many of them. You have to buy more tickets. No, no, there, there were. You have to buy more tickets. It, you, know, you know, if you're a season ticket holder and they have a lot, you have to, you know, buy another ticket package for the NCAA tournament. So, right. uh, people have to make that commitment. I mean, three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. The, the place, place was, was jumping. It was pretty full, and it the was. atmosphere was really great. Yeah. Uh, a lot of apprehension, but it, it was great. <laughs> and then, ye- and then yesterday, it was even better. The players come in and after the game, uh, they, you know, I saw. Uh, I didn't talk to them. I didn't go in the locker room, but uh, Haley uh, Van Lith and Angel Reese said, you know, it was hard to hear. Hard. To, Haley said it was hard for me to make the plays heard, and Angel Reese said, I'm looking to the bench to see I got the play right, and. Uh, so it was it was tremendous, like maybe not quite nothing I've ever ever seen in the PMAC, um, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't say it was exactly like 2019 with the, okay. the men's game. That's no. fair. I, I I really did. I was not in the arena, so I did want to put it to you guys because that was the vibe I was getting off the TV. Just it, it, the part of the reason I say that is because it was just. I mean, it was loud and lively in the second half during breaks, you know, for free throws and timeouts and yeah. things of that nature. It's just, I mean, they were the crowd was on it. And I don't think there's any question, if I'm not mistaken, either Van Lith or Angel or maybe both had mentioned just what what a difference that crowd made in terms of being able to get yeah. them to focus and turn around. You know, if that, that game had been in Albuquerque, New Mexico or someplace like that, this might have been a whole lot tighter. They might not have turned the corner and turned it on in just the way they did. Uh, this is the LSU Sports Insider brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate, NOLA.com and The Times Picayune. Uh, you know where to find all the writers' great work that's at The Advocate, so please subscribe to The Advocate if you have not already. 
whether that is print or digital or both, go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe. Uh, again, I know we've said it many times, but uh, no t- no time more, uh, more so than now. Uh, there is quite a lot going on on campus, quite a lot of stories going on uh, at the moment. And so, of course, uh, the best way to keep... Uh, keep your arms wrapped all around them and stay up to date with everything. You uh, you can get our newsletter sent straight to your inbox. To do that, to sign up, you can go to theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. Uh, we are here on Mondays and Thursdays on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever other finer podcasts are found. And, of course, we are here live on all our social channels every Monday and Thursday, specifically our YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. Uh, you can catch us there live. If you don't catch us live, you can catch us after the fact. Uh, so please uh, subscribe to that channel and don't miss a moment. That way you won't miss a moment. Uh, and speaking of which, if you're uh, looking for maybe a spring football update or some other stuff, uh, you can check out our previous podcast. There's an update on baseball as well. Our previous podcast uh, where Wilson Alexander broke down spring football, what he has seen to this point. And, of course, Cokie Riley heading into the Florida series. Uh, I had discussed uh, some of the things that were disappointing going into that series and evidently still are. No uh, less disappointing now. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> As LSU drops two of three and uh, this is going to start to get to be a little concern, I think, here uh, uh, before too long. Long way to go, obviously. Uh, but LSU uh, certainly felt like they had a deep enough pitching staff to get them through. And they've been run ruled twice now in two SEC weekends. So that is something certainly to uh, to check out and keep an eye on. So anyway, uh, you can catch up with uh, all our previous podcasts on that same YouTube channel. And of course, we are brought uh, brought to you by uh, Champion Wealth Strategies. Uh, every Monday and Thursday on this fine channel. So please go to championwealthstrategies.com and plan like a champion today. Uh, so LSU is in, into the uh, the round of 16. Uh, we don't yet know. This is, of course, midday Monday, and we won't, uh, we won't know uh, whom LSU will face in the round of 16 up in Albany, New York, where these two fine gentlemen will be uh, basking in the sun and the I, beautiful weather. Can we? I, can I asked Reed, I said, he's getting an early start on his bucket list by going to, going to upstate New York. <laughs> uh, you know. In March, right? Well, it's yeah. exactly at such a young age. Good for you. destination. Yeah, I mean, it's either, it's either San Juan or upstate New York in, in, the, middle of, in the middle of March. Uh, uh, but we don't, we don't know who they'll play but uh, because uh, they are awaiting the winner between second-seeded UCLA and seventh-seeded Creighton, who play Monday night. Uh, and on the other side of the bracket, uh, number one seeded Iowa is playing number seven seeded West Colorado. I think, I think Colorado. Oh, I beg your pardon. Colorado's five. Um, but no, aren't no, they? No, they don't play them yet. Right, they're, that's what I'm they, saying. They're oh, playing oh, West Virginia. Right. They're right. Yeah. 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 So bad. they're playing West Virginia tonight, and we will. Uh, but let's just let's play pretend here uh, just for a moment, and let's just say uh, that the favorites win, that the chalk win, wins out from here. Uh, on these last two games, if that is the case uh, in the uh, Albany 2 regional, it will be uh, LSU, excuse me, number one seeded Iowa versus number five seeded Colorado on one side, and then number uh, two seeded LSU versus number three, excuse me, number two seeded UCLA versus number three seeded LSU. Uh, So let's play pretend here for a moment and just say uh, that LSU is going to face UCLA up in Albany for its next game. We don't know this yet, but we'll just, we'll, and you know what they say about assuming as well, but let's just say that, that, that that's going to be the matchup. Uh, what would you what would you say, Reed, in terms of this is what LSU has to do to be able to come out with a victory and be able to make it to the regional final in what is a rough and tough and rugged regional? They have to defend really well. Um, UCLA, they have Lauren Betts, who's um, six foot seven. She's one of the best players in the country. She, she's a center. She missed the last game with a foot injury. I'm not really sure if that's going to you know, be a long-term type of deal or if it's going to keep her out of the Sweet 16, um, but it's something to watch. Um, but even if they don't have her, they have a player named Kiki Rice who um, really led them through um, their, their round one win. So LSU's going to have to defend. Like it's, it's, It always comes down to defense for mm-hmm. them. You know, they, we saw that in the first two rounds. If they defend, they can run out in transition, and that's when, when they're really at their best. So you know, just watch how, how LSU defends, how they rebound, and how they get out in transition. And I think if they can really, you know, ignite that transition attack then they can beat anyone in the country and that includes ucla even if you know they have 
Um, there's those two stars who can sort of match them on offense. He certainly uh, reason a uh, voter on the AP women's basketball poll this year, so he's watched a lot of these games. Watched them more than me. I, I'm, I'm spread a little thin They're looking at all the different <laughs> sports and everything. I, I will say uh, probably another thing is a slight advantage for LSU. It's a long way to travel for everybody, but UCLA is playing at home on on tonight. LSU's had an right. extra day of rest, and then they're going to have to go all the way across country yeah. to Albany. To uh, I'm sure they were not. I'm sure they would love to be in Portland. That's the or Oregon, the side of the other region. I'm yes. sure they would have much preferred. That. But uh, they're going to have to go all the way across the country to play uh, Saturday against LSU at a time to be determined. But uh, uh, but they have an excellent team. People thought from the beginning of the season they were excellent. I don't think they've lived up to it. And it, it was a uh, as Jay Clark, the gymnastics coach, like to say, it was a, it's a meat, it was a meat grinder. The Pac-12 in its last yeah, season. that's a great point. Pac-12 has been the best conference mm-hmm. you know in, in the country you know in its last season. Mm-hmm. Um, so they've they're battle tested. Mm-hmm. They've, they've played a lot of really good teams. Um, a lot more good teams than LSU has certainly played. So they've they've been through that meat grinder, as you said, and then and they've you know they've gotten through it so far. And then you know so it'll it'll be interesting. I haven't you know dove into the numbers too closely yet, but. Um, it's going to be difficult for LSU to get to the Final Four. You mentioned rebounding. It gives me an opportunity to just bring up. I mean, we, we know about Angel Reese. What did she have? Uh, yes, just something like 19 points and 11 rebounds. Or excuse me. I think she had uh, 19 rebounds. Um, 19, 19, 20 points, 11 rebounds. I apologize. Oh, okay. uh, you know, double-double machine. Uh, but it does. This is a perfect time for me seemingly to bring up Anissa Morrow and just how, you know, she quietly herself had a double double for being only what, six foot one maybe? I mean, mm-hmm. just absolutely gets the most out of what she's got and just how important not only Angel going up against a six foot seven opponent, but uh, but Anissa being it both of those two players crash into boards as much as they can and maybe to a lesser degree Del Rosario. Uh you know, you mentioned as we discussed earlier on this on this podcast. You know, the being being able to get a stop and get out and transition, just how important that is, and just how important uh, you know that Anissa Moro and and some of these other players uh, will be, despite being at a at a height disadvantage. If indeed LSU does make it, excuse me, UCLA does make it through to the Sweet Sixteen. So, uh, something to note. On the other side, uh, Iowa, we presume that Iowa will take care of West Virginia. And if so, it'll be Iowa versus Colorado. These are two teams that LSU knows a little bit about. <laughs> uh, sure. You know, give us a read, if you would, give us a 30-second breakdown of these two teams, Iowa and Colorado. Iowa, Caitlin Clark, there's nothing you can do with Caitlin Clark. She's going <laughs> to score 25 to 30, 35 points no right. matter what you do. So right. um, LSU, if they do face a, face Iowa in the Elite Eight, they're going to try to let's prevent – the other Iowa players from beating them. She didn't shoot that well in their first round game, though. Did no, she, she didn't. She, yeah. It wasn't her best. It was game. kind of an off night for um, her. But but you're right. You, you, you still have to put on a show. You have to expect that, that's yeah. how she's going to get hers. You got to defend the rest. That's yeah. how they approach the national championship game. They're like, we're going to let Kaylin get hers. There's nothing we can do about it. We got to take care of everyone else and make sure no one else uh, scores, you know, 10, 15 points a game. Um, so so that's Iowa. That's going to be the challenge with them. Um, Colorado, I, I still come, come back to that season opening game. It's like uh, this is a bad matchup for LSU. You know, Jalen Sherrod um, is really quick, really dynamic, really good at attacking the rim. Um, LSU has sort of struggled to contain dribble penetration at times this season. Um, then they've also got a lot of, you know, size around the rim. They've also got a lot of shooting as well. And so it, that's going to be difficult for Angel and Anissa to handle around the rim. They did a poor job in, in season opener of, um, you know, Aaron at of, of guarding her around the rim and then getting rebounds. So um, it'll be a good measuring stick to see exactly how much LSU has improved from the first game of the season. You know, Colorado, um, it's a bad matchup for LSU and, you know, they, they can, they can easily beat them again. I think. Fascinating. Uh, again, as we discussed, this is easily, in everybody's opinion, most everybody's opinion, that the Albany, Albany 2 Regional is the toughest. And I know we discussed this on the previous podcast. It says everything that the number five seed uh, in this in this regional is somebody that has beaten LSU and is capable seemingly of beating anybody in that tournament. It had, had nine losses. It's the reason they're, they're five seed. They didn't have a great regular season. But, uh, again, as we've said over and over and over again on this podcast, Colorado came out in that season opener, wanted a piece of LSU, and got them. Would, and, and wouldn't it be ironic, incidentally, if and we're getting way, way, way ahead of ourselves here, but let's just say LSU takes care of UCLA or Creighton in this, and then they go play uh, either Iowa or Colorado, and then ultimately in the championship game, again, we're 
doing a whole lot. For for instance. Yes, for instance. We're not saying this is going to happen or that we're banking on it, but let's just say that this we're going to go all the way to the end. Then you go play South Carolina in the championship game. This could be a little uh, Kim Mulkey revenge tour, Angel Reese (laughs) revenge tour all the way through to the championship. And frankly, I think they've this team has shown over and over again that they've got kind of the right attitude to be able to to be able to do that they're they're not going to shy away from a fight so to speak Reed's analysis is quite sound about Colorado I, I think LSU would would love to get a, I think uh, they a would second too. shot at Colorado I, th- I think they I would the attitude counts for a lot and obviously they're playing better defense than they did then doesn't mean there's not still a bad uh, tough matchup for LSU or a bad matchup but I, I think they would but uh, yeah we're you know predictions are always fun to make I, I got to pick on Reed just a tiny bit yesterday <laughs> we're, we're sitting there uh, we're sitting there courtside at, at, at the game and he said uh, I don't think Del Rosario is going to play at all today she can't handle the quickness I said yeah you're probably right and uh, probably right yeah and as if on cue she popped up off the bench <laughs> to come in <laughs> Come yeah. into the scores table to come in the game. <laughs> Shows what we know, right? Shows you what I know. You know. Uh, yep. But no, he's he's been great, and it was that's very well. He, whenever he says something, it's very well reasoned. You know, hey, he's every, got a good reason behind well, it. But it's, like, but it's just like anything in sports, right? Everything, every every time you think you've got something clocked, boy, look at this. Speaking of surprises, uh, Reed, uh, can you can you walk us through? Uh, you're there doing your job on Saturday in between yep. days between LSU's first round game and their second round game. And uh, for those who don't know, obviously, uh, in many cases, in most cases now anymore, colleges are sort of very protective of their coaches and players. They make access, uh, frankly, pretty limited to specifically players, especially. And this is more the case with football. Kim Mulkey, to her credit, actually is, is very she's very accommodating with her with herself and with her players, actually, to the press. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, access is not 100% until you get to the NCAA tournament because uh, it's open locker room policy. You can go talk to anybody you want to, a freshman, uh, somebody who's been through God only knows legal troubles or something like that. They're they're all they're all there to uh, to be able to uh, to be able to interview. Uh, and so, uh, Reed, you're there on Saturday at the PMAC uh, at the media avail- availability. I'll just let you sort of take it from there. Yeah, kudos to NCAA for you know giving us that access. Yes, you know it's really great. It's really uh, unique. It's not something we get very often. So, um, in my eyes, I'm trying to take advantage of that. You know, there's about a 30 minute window in between games in the locker room to get to talk to players. Um, you know, so I you know sort of bounced around as many people as talk as possible. You know, talk to them a little bit, get to know them a little better. Um, and what the NCAA does, they take the press conferences and they put the transcripts on a you know media portal, a media hub. So I'm like, all right, I'll I'll, I'll just get quotes from from Mulkey, you know, on the transcripts and so after they close the locker room and then Mulkey's done with the press conference I walk into the media room and I ask some of the people in there I'm like oh she say anything interesting and, and they sort of laughed at me they're like ha 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 and I'm like wait wait, wait what are you talking about what, what did I miss and so and then I pull up Twitter and then I see the videos and I'm like oh 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 here's this is gonna be something that we'll have to deal with um so I don't it's just like uh, it was I was I think we were all shocked and surprised we we knew we knew the what we know you know we saw the tweet from Pat Forty about the Washington Post uh, right. story. Um, it's just a really weird situation all around, a really unique situation all around. So I'll, I'll defer to to you guys. For and that. and and if our viewers are wondering where where was Ravelay, you know, you know the, I was in New Orleans at the gymnastics the SEC gymnastics championship. There's plenty going on. I, I <laughs> yeah, I've got to be honest with you guys. I don't remember. I was home on Saturday. Uh, working from home, and I can't remember what exactly I was up to, but I was up to something else. And then our group, we have amongst uh, our LSU beat team, there is a group chat. And a certain somebody in the group chat just posted a mushroom cloud, and I, I didn't, I frankly <laughs> didn't know what this was all about because I had not heard or seen anything. I was off doing something else. And then, of course, we all get uh, quickly, quickly apprised of the matter. Kim Mulkey uh, opens. Um, Opens her her Q and A session with a about a four minute statement uh, that she's clearly reading from, uh, where she's very much on the defensive, saying that uh, that a reporter from the Washington Post, who we know to be Kent Babb, is working on what she calls a hit piece or a hit job on her. She has decided to not speak to him over the past two years while he's been trying to work on a profile on her, uh, and. Uh, to be clear, before we're going to get too deep into this, this story as of midday Monday has not dropped. We don't know what's in it, so it's going to, so it's very, very difficult for us to even speculate on what may or may not have been out of bounds, what probably was 
certainly in bounds. And we'll get to this because we all feel like the Washington Post will have lawyered the hell out of this story before it comes out. Uh, so whatever's in there is in all likelihood uh, going to be true to one degree or another because uh, they're, they're not really too keen on getting sued and losing in court. So, uh, but she threatens to sue the Washington Post and said if there's a false story published about her, uh, w- took issue with the Washington Post giving her and LSU uh, what she said f- was 48 hours uh, to respond to a series of questions. Um, and, uh, says she has hired the best defamation, uh, law firm in the country, uh, unnamed to this point, uh, to defend her against any and all possible, um, uh, slander, libel, um, uh, however you want to put it. And so, uh, Rab, I, I will just say this and I'll use my own words first, uh, just to, just to throw my two cents in there. Uh, but you're the columnist, and I, I will I will say to you I'll, I'll say this, and then I'll put it to you. On the one hand, this does not necessarily surprise me because Kim Mulkey does not shy away from a fight. On the other hand, it surprises me in the sense that uh, you know, no matter how you slice this, I think that it's, it's perfectly reasonable to conclude that. Whatever Kim Mulkey's intentions may have been, she has drawn an extraordinary amount more attention to what this story will be if and when it comes out. I mean, you know, if she's trying to get this thing squashed, all she did was just take a flamethrower to it and blow it up that much more, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, conventional wisdom says see what the story says. You know, maybe it's going to be yeah, something we, that you again, really take we offense don't know, at. No, right. We don't know. Maybe it's going to be something <laughs> that you really find offensive. Maybe it will not. And, and let's go back a little bit for a little bit of context. Kent Babb is the writer who two years ago wrote a story about Brian Kelly uh, when he first came here making $10 million a year while there's all this poverty in Baton Rouge. And, and it, Kim referred to that as a hit piece on Kelly, and I, I, I read that story. I wouldn't I exactly call it that. I didn't think it was a hit job on Kelly, frankly. No, I think it was more... You could say, well, you could say you could have written that story in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, about Nick Saban in Alabama and a, the community and the depiction, poverty there. Right. It was a or, depiction of a college town that yeah. happened to have been Baton yeah. Rouge. But it, it could have been written about Steve Sarkeesian and uh, poverty in Austin, or right. Ryan Day and poverty in Columbus, Ohio, or you know, uh, uh, you know Kirby Smart in Athens. Any you could pick the college community. And but again, we feel a little picked on in mm-hmm. the state sometimes, for better or for worse, and right. and that happens. And so uh, I think conventional wisdom would be that you wait to see what it says and then react to that. But uh, when you and when you, um, from a journalistic standpoint, when you see someone trying to, it, clearly she would like the story not to come out. It, it makes it look like you have something to hide. Right. I'm not saying she does, but it, but it, you give you give that uh, that appearance. Uh, I don't think uh, I don't think the folks at LSU were what would have picked for this her to make this statement <laughs> uh, clearly, but uh, Kim Mulkey does what Kim Mulkey is going to do. Right. Kim Mulkey does not play the game. Right. You know, and for better or for worse. Right. You know, and um, and sometimes it's to her detriment. Sometimes she she has put herself in position over the years to be criticized, but I think. Um, and if if this if this reporter talked to disgruntled former players, I think you can find disgruntled former players anywhere. I think you can find disgruntled former players on the LSU men's basketball team this year. You know, and we just saw you particularly know, in this one, day and age when everybody transfers. When everybody, you, you, yeah, can, you can find. Yeah. Now, I will say this: it wouldn't surprise me. We don't know for sure because nobody's going to keep data on this, and I don't know how you would ascertain data or, or make a judgment call. But it would not surprise me if there were a larger percentage of disgruntled players. Who leave Kim Mulkey's program than the average college basketball? And coach. and 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 why why because she's could because be, she's not for everybody. She's I not mean, for this, everybody, and she she's tough. She yes. holds people to to a high a high standard. And uh, uh you know uh, if I may use the kiss, some guy tweeted last night. I don't know who this is. Some talk show host in Texas saying I don't miss Governor Hurt Baylor. You know she she was very difficult to deal with. Like I said uh, one time after they talking going into the season after they won a title, Coach, you're you're. You're the defending national champions, and she cut him off saying, 
we're not the defending national champions. We're not defending anything. You know, we want, and and she's right. You don't yeah. defend the na- defending national champions is a misnomer. Right. I, I've tried to no, get I away agree. from that statement. Yes. You're the rain, LSU's the reigning national champions. If they don't win this year, nobody says, well, you got to give it yeah, back the right. trophy They're from not last year. Away the title. So that's a very small thing. But um, my my point is, she holds a lot of people to a high standard, and that's not for for everybody. Yes, she's going to have disgruntled players, just like I'm sure Gino Ariema does, just like I'm sure Pat Summit did, just like. Tara Vandeveer at Stanford does, uh, you know, whatever. And uh, then she got people who love her. She embraced one of her former players who's an assistant coach from Middle Tennessee before the game. Yeah, right, yes, Nina Davis. And, right. um, I, you know, I, I, w- I will say that, if, you know, if, you know, I don't know, again, we don't know what the story is going to say, but, it, you know, the flip side of it is <laughs> would Angel Reese have stayed for a second year if Kim Mulkey was, you know, this yeah, Nazi in high heels, as <laughs> people per- we want to portray her to be. Would Anissa Morrow, who could have transferred anywhere in the country, have come to LSU if if she was you know just this awful person, you know, completely without redeeming characters? Would every member of her staff at Baylor, but one coach who wanted to stay in Texas for the retirement, uh, to to stay in the retirement system there, have come with her from Baylor? Because I can remember another coach who came here in two thousand. We sent the plane. They sent the plane back to Michigan State for his staff, and no one got on it. Sure, that, and sure. that was Nick Saban, who's someone you could now, c- compare her again, to. Again, to be fair, for every Alexis Morris, maybe not for every Alexis Morris, maybe not, who got kicked off the team and and still begged Kim Mulkey to take her back, and to this day will not bash Kim. She loves her. Uh, for every one of those players, there, I'm going to guess that there are maybe not one for one, but there are plenty of. Hannah Gusters of the world, and sure. of course Brittany Griner's, and all you know, any number of the. She is not for everybody, and I'm going to guess that reputation is well earned. Tough. We don't. Again, we don't know exactly what may or may not come out in this uh, Washington Post story yet. So it's 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 very difficult to to speculate and, and to decide until we until we know. Uh, but again, you know, you, you guys have heard me say this before. I, I know that Bobby Knight is not the most popular person, not popular basketball coach in this town in particular because of all his run-ins with LSU and not very popular among many fan bases. I would have loved to play for Bobby Knight. I know I'm in the minority, and, and I, I, I don't suspect for one second that I would have enjoyed it. I feel like I probably would, would have been tortured by it. But look, mm-hmm. you know, with the benefit of hindsight, now having been in my 40s, I would have loved, because I think that, that type of guy, that type of coach, would have gotten the most out of me, and and Bobby Knight, Re- regardless of how I feel, sure. felt about him after the fact. Yeah, so. you're right, and and maybe that would have would have worked with your your mindset, right. your, your personality. And look, there's a lot of things you could say about Bobby Knight that, that we've heard, and and, and, uh, and I, I'm I'm kind of waiting to see is, does this story going to have anything like that? You know, mm-hmm. you, know you know, Bobby Knight put his hands on players, and it was awful. Bobby Knight also had a reputation for not cheating. Yes. For 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 running for a very clean program. Nearly and, 100% of right, his players. Right. People I guess the point I'm making is if I, if I may if I may I think it's human nature to want to put people in a box mm-hmm. and especially in sports. He's a good guy, he's a bad guy. She's a bad person, she she's she's a saint and and then, and once we've done that, we don't want to Listen. let anything change that that opinion. And and but really, people are. I'm a shades of gray person. I, I see. Th- I don't see a things. A lot of things black and white. And I think that a lot of people have different layers to them. And Kim Mulkey's got a lot of layers. Yes. No question. She is a complicated person. Hey, look, both things can be true. Both Bobby things not, can be Bobby true. Bobby Knight exactly. could have gotten a whole lot out of his players. Won tons of games. Two national. Cha- two national championships. Three national championships. Three. Oh. Hey, what was it 76, 81, and 80, it doesn't matter. 87. But uh, well, that's true. He, he could, Very good. He, both things can be true. He could be a tremendously successful coach who's got thousands of people, ex players in his corner, who, get, who will all say that he got the most out of them. And he deserved to be fired at Indiana. Both things can be true. Right. And in that case, That's it right. was. You know, those both things were true. To be perfectly clear, we have no idea what's coming out. It's, it's, it is so hard for us to speculate on what may or may not be in this Washington Post story. But, yes, uh, I, I don't think there is a person alive who would say that Kim Mulkey's got a lot of sub layers to her. Uh, one thing I will say, just sort of in closing on this matter, is that uh, if you spend any amount of time around her or know what her career has been like, I will say this, and I think this is fair to say about Kim Mulkey. Uh, whether it whether it should be this way or not, Kim Mulkey is one who feels like you are either with me or you are not with me at all. You are 100 percent against me. And I am absolutely ready to go to war, metaphorically speaking, if you are not with me. So right. 
And if I miss that you, is so part of what's going to complicate this whole matter. I'm, and for that matter, yeah. maybe her legacy too. Yeah, sure, sure. And I think, uh, I think she uh, reads covered her this year. I don't know if she agrees or not. God bless you, Reed. <laughs> I'm keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> no, that's right. That's that's a good book. Uh, she, um, I think she. Uh, she 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 uh, she doesn't shy away from a fight, and in fact, I think she looks for things to sharpen her yes. edge on. Jordan esque, yeah. Somebody and, play and with she, her she'll, in the she'll take, Olympics. Yeah, yeah, and I think that there are a lot more people in sports like that than people realize. Right. You know, you, you see you see it with you know with golfers and stuff like that. Jordan you know, was looking know, for a reason to get PO'd. He would right. make stuff up. In exactly, his own head. exactly right. Exactly right. That, that's that's a very common trait in right. sports, and I think I think she is you know. Hundred percent. Because remember, she was a great player on the high school level. She was a great player on the college level. She was, <laughs> she's a great head coach, and you don't get that way without being in extraordinarily competitive, and and have have some passion to you, right. you know. And uh, she is who she is, and is, doesn't apologize right, for it. The question is whether there is, you know, an Icarus syndrome. That's you know, you can all the thing. The thing that makes you so great is maybe gets you makes you. Fly a little bit too close to the sun, and so again, we, like you said, nothing interesting. Yes, to talk about <laughs> nothing interesting going on. Well, speaking <laughs> speaking of a very non controversial uh, uh, moment unfolding of uh, events, well, uh, again, Rab, as you said, you were all too happy to be in New Orleans Boy, on Saturday was I? Uh, at the Smoothie King Center, where uh, the SEC championships were going on. Uh, LSU claims the SEC championship, uh, which is not necessarily a surprise, but they post a score of 198.075. This is their fourth championship since 2017. Uh, and uh, at first things first, I'm curious to know what the, I, I don't suspect that session one, of which LSU was not a part, the mm-hmm. afternoon session, that the atmosphere was, you know, was packed to the rafters and everybody's no. going crazy and things of that nature. But I, I, w- I am curious to know what the what the atmosphere was like uh, in session two when LSU was there. Uh, it was obviously part, partisan LSU. There, there were fans there from from some of the other schools, from Florida mm-hmm. and Alabama and Kentucky. Um, you know, there was some sports. In fact, Gabby Glado, one of the Alabama gymnasts, her dad came and was doing taking video right near where I was sitting when she was on vault. Um, and so uh, it, it was great. Uh, you know, they, they it wasn't. It was a little bit under the attendance they had in 2019. They had 10,500 then. They had 98-something, 9,800-something this time. But I think, uh, as I wrote a, a story as well, that they are, they're, the people in New Orleans are very keen for it to come back. Mm-hmm. And I think the SEC is very interested in coming back uh, to, to New Orleans, to the Smoothie King Center. So I, I think it was a successful event for everyone. Of course, very successful for LSU to win the, the, win the championship and win all the individual titles that they did, uh, their gymnasts did. Connor McLean with a 10 on beam. She the only was, 10. She, she, no, was, she, she was the only perfect 10 at the yes. meet. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it Haley, was, and it was excellent. There are 10s and there are 10s, but it was. Well, that's. I, was I do want to come back to that that whole perfect 10 thing, and this is frankly probably a story we should do at some point here uh, in the near future, if not this season and soon. But uh, going back to the meet itself, Haley Bryant won the all-around title. Uh, it, First things first, let's just, I mean, t- tell us what you think about all this, where LSU stands. They, uh, 198.075 is nothing to sneeze at. But then, of course, we know that Oklahoma <laughs> notched the highest score of all time, uh, almost got all the way up to 199 uh, at the Big 12 meet. So uh, Oklahoma is a clear number one. Going to be in LSU, the SEC next year. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Probably. Coming into that's the right. SEC, so it's going to be tough. And they may have to actually incidentally adjust their style to to, they might. to compete yeah. in the SEC uh, for reasons that we've discussed before. Four on this podcast, but uh, you know wh- where does where does LSU stand as they uh, as they wait to uh, to uh, find out their fate in terms of where they go for the NCAA regionals? Yeah, as as, as Jay Clark is fond of saying, you can't play defense in, in gymnastics. Correct. You can only go there and do your best, and they're doing their best. They're they're back to number two in the country. They were three. They went back to two with with their performance they had the other day. This was count as another road score. Their 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 season in QS, which is. You take the five best scores, uh, throwing out the top score, and have to be three road scores. It's like 198-210, mm-hmm. which is probably it's got to be the best LSU's ever had going into the NCAA uh, into NCAA competition. So they're doing the very best they can, mm-hmm. and I think it, this may, especially as validated with the SEC gymnastics championship uh, meet title, uh, is is probably you know, looking like this could be their best team ever. Now, does that mean they can beat Oklahoma? You know. No, I, I'm sure there were a lot of great teams that couldn't beat the Celtics when they were on that <laughs> that championship title run in, That's the, right. in the 1960s. Who, uh, the Lakers were really good with Will That's Chamberlain, right. right? And they couldn't they couldn't beat them. But 
all you can do is all you can do. And they were they were tremendous. They they won or shared all the individual titles, which is it's no mean feat when you're going in into a you, know, you had the four teams earlier, but the it's four not, teams yeah, in the evening session were top ten. Here. Yeah. They were top ten teams. Florida right. was number four. Kentucky was six. Alabama was nine or ten. Um, and then uh, Haley Bryant won the all around. Connor McLean won the beam title, obviously with with, with that. Ashley Cowan was surprised uh, she shared the uneven bars title. And then Kaya Johnson, KJ Johnson, who did the the floor performance of her her life, uh, and uh, Raina Worley from Kentucky shared the uh, shared the floor title. And, and Haley also won the vault title, which she won as a freshman in twenty one. If I may, I said I don't want to talk numbers, but I got to I got to share some numbers with you on Haley go, Bryant. Go on ahead, sure. Okay. Haley Bryant uh, is having a uh, dream season. She's the number one all-arounder in the country. She's tied for first on vault. She's, uh, obviously, a two-time SEC champion uh, this year. She's going three overall. She's performed 46 individual routines the course of this season. 43 of those have been a score of 9-9-0 or better, including the last 31 straight. <laughs> is that good? That's good. It's 25 <laughs> scores of 9-9-5 or better. Which is this fifty four percent, and of course that includes six perfect ten. So a nine nine five, the way judging works, it, it's in increments of point oh five. So you can get a nine eight zero, a nine eight five, a nine nine zero, a nine nine five. If you get a nine nine five, that is just you're just shy of perfection according right. to that judge. And they had four judges of the meet the other night. The worst score she had was a nine nine two five. Um, that's that's pretty. I mean, and again, sc- gymnastics scoring is certainly subjective. Yes, but. Her, but when you do the that, the consistency that often, of right. effort, 31 straight. Her worst score this year is a 985, which is not bad by any means. It's, it's a B. Plus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? right. It, right. It's not bad work. And uh, I, I can't think, and I've covered LSU for a long time, I can't think of another athlete other than maybe like Chris Jackson or something like that that I've ever seen at LSU who was this consistently. Excellent. That's a bold statement considering I'm all the exceptional you. athletes who come through LSU. Bob Moore, the former uh, the former LSU assistant, who was a longtime assistant for Dee Bro and for Jay Clark, a summer before the meeting, he, he thinks she's the best ever. Wow. He thinks she's the best ever at LSU. And she might come back next year. She might come back for her fifth year. Haley, Haley, Haley Bryant was incredible last year as well. You, know, yeah. you remember the run <laughs> yes. she had last year. Um, yeah. It was similar. I think this year, it's safe to say she's having an even better year this year than she did last year. You know, given the standard oh, no she question. set for herself last yeah. year, so it's just like we, we'd be remiss if we didn't, you know, sort of. Spend Over the some last time. two seasons, she's had one score less than a nine eight zero. She had a nine seven seven five at Kentucky early last season, January of twenty three. Pretty incredible. It's just incredible. If you know, watch them if you can in the regional. Watch them if they make it to nationals, and uh, and if you if you haven't seen them, and uh, and hope like Jay Clark does that she decides to come back for a for a fifth season. The uh, in the meantime, the NCAA regionals are uh, April third through the seventh at a campus to be determined. Uh, where oh, LSU oh, will go? Uh, this just in. Oh, this just in. We have breaking news on our podcast. Oh, Would you like by all means, yes. Uh, LSU is headed to Fayetteville, Arkansas for their regional. Fayetteville. They will compete on uh, Thursday, April 4th. Okay. So they have this weekend off, then they compete uh, next week. So I, I knew they were going to Fayetteville mm-hmm. or Ann Arbor right. because the other two regionals were at, yeah, at Cal or in Gainesville, and they were too highly seeded, those schools, for LSU to be sent there. So, so LSU is going to, to Fayetteville, Arkansas. After familiar that, territory. After the very familiar territory. After that is uh, two weeks after that will be the championships in Fort Worth, right. Texas, April 18th through the 20th. Uh, we discussed Oklahoma will be the favorite, obviously, sort sure. of a heavy favorite. No question. Uh, but I, I, I will say, uh, Rab, you're going to remember this, and I think we might have brought this up on a previous episode, but there was one year where LSU went to the championships. On the first night, they had the highest score of anybody, any team right. that was at the meet, mm-hmm. you know, either day. And then on the second night, well, they didn't they didn't score so so well, and so they finished as national runner up. Had you been able to flip, because they still would have made it through. Right. Had you been able to flip those two scores, and the first score was actually what they had on championship night, they would have come home as a national champion. And you just listen, you just never, you know, who's to say that LSU, uh, LSU, Oklahoma might, you know, might fall down. It, it doesn't might fall take off much. The there, was one, there was one That's year. Right. There was one year in Fort Worth. Oklahoma was on floor. One of their gymnasts stepped out of bounds, like Aliyah Finnegan stepped out of bounds the other night, and and Kaya Johnson and Haley had to hit on floor, and they and they did. But um, 
one more Oklahoma gymnast steps out of bounds, LSU's doing what they did was exactly. going to win, slip in and win. Exactly. So it doesn't take much. No. Uh, you know, you fall off the beam or you, you miss the handhold on the bars or something like that. It, it doesn't take very much. But Oklahoma is going to have to help whoever wants to catch them, LSU, California, Correct. Florida, Utah. They're going to they're gonna have to give them a little help because, obviously, as you said, they are the, the favorite, and rightly so. LSU is a th- three-time runner-up, national runner-up? Four. Four-time national yeah. runner-up. Still gunning for that first national championship. They will have every chance to do so, and we will know in less than a month whether they're able to do it. Uh, obviously, in the meantime, uh, we've got our hands full. <laughs> LSU's got their hands full. The LSU women uh, trying to make it through the Albany 2 Regional. It's been, you know... March Madness, man. Men or women, it, it, it always delivers. We haven't had a lot of buzzer beaters on either side, but I'll tell you what, I'll be damned if uh, Iowa State and Stanford didn't put on a show last night. And, of course, the A&M men uh, against uh, University of Houston last night, they put on quite a show, too. Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma Oregon, and uh, who did they play? They took to overtime. Uh, Gonz- uh, not Gonzaga, Creighton. Uh, the night before, so they took it to overtime. And that was, you know, because I took it to the Will Wade's oh, uh, McNeese team, boy, uh, unfortunately they? for the yeah. Cowboys. That was a trendy upset pick, that and uh, that was if you put some money down on that one, you lost it really, really quick, and you knew you lost it really, really quick. So, <laughs> uh, thankfully, I'm just, again, I'm just happy I don't have the betting gene in me. This is good. It's, did, it's kept me out of a lot of trouble. You, did say. you see? Um, uh, the NCAA.com kept track of, of all of all the brackets on all the major bracket sites mm-hmm. and the best anyone did they got to like 30 and oh i think they got the first 30 games right and then yeah. and then uh i thought it was pretty good I mean, 30 first 30 or 31 games Absolutely. right and there was a, there are no perfect brackets out of 31 million there are no perfect brackets obviously going to the sweet 16 over auburn i mean come on you know just, just, just yale fans i mean as yeah. it comes down to it right you know? but then if you have alabama them, fans maybe right 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 <laughs> the best story i heard was the oakland of course upset kentucky mm-hmm. and their coach said they found that the eight thousand dollars worth of uh, Oakland T-shirts got bought by people in Louisville. Yes, and he said, "Are they going to wear them when they play Kentucky next year?" I don't. Well, much the way, I think there was a, a similar story. You know, some whichever year it was when St. Peter's upset them. That there was a whole bunch of St. Peter's gear that got shipped to Louisville, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. People were showing showing their gratitude. So exactly. uh, Louisville still got to find a coach. Well, we'll this is a this is an LSU podcast. We're going to get derailed here very quickly. But uh, obviously LSU, there's plenty a lot uh, plenty and a lot going on as always on that campus. It's gentlemen, it's just never a dull moment. Uh, we will see what happens next. Crazy days at LSU. They just they never really stop. They haven't stopped since 1986 or whatever. Dale Brown, Dale Brown comes to mind. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's going on right uh, now? So we will, uh, of course, The Advocate's the number one place to uh, to stay on top of everything. Please subscribe to The Advocate. We've uh, we've always been known as the number one destination for LSU sports coverage, so stick with us. Uh, if you have not subscribed already, whether that's in print or digital or both, please go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe and join the party. Uh, you stay up to date with everything. Uh, keep up to date with all the latest headlines. Get it sent to you. Get them all sent to your uh, to your inbox with the LSU newsletter. To do that, go to theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. Uh, we are here on the LSU Sports Insider every Monday and Thursday uh, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever other finer podcasts are found. Uh, but more importantly, we are live on all our social channels, specifically the YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. You can catch us there live. If you don't catch us live, you can always catch us there after the fact. So don't miss an episode. Again, uh, we uh, did uh, a little review of us or a review to this point of spring football in a previous episode. So please check that out. In addition to this one, you can uh, find all those episodes on our YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. And of course, we are brought to you every Monday and Thursday on the LSU Sports Insider by Champion Wealth Strategies. Uh, they've been with us uh, all season and they will continue to be with us. And we are certainly appreciative of them. Please go to championwealthstrategies.com and plan like a champion today. Uh, gentlemen, have a great time in Albany. I hope, the, I, hope, uh, I hope you get to see at least one snowstorm, if not... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if not a dumpster fire, or, or perhaps both, we might be in the running for both. Is it really uh, in the snow? I, 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 oh. I, I got to be honest, right. I have no idea. Yeah. I just know it's upstate New York and it's still March, and a lot of times, speaking as somebody who grew up in the Midwest, it can snow in April, baby, and it can uh, come down hard in April, so you just never know. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, so, yeah, check that weather report before you pack. I sure will. Uh, for Reed Darcy, for Scott Rabelais, for Amelia Cotton behind the glass on Parent Keys, this has been the LSU Sports Insider. <laughs>